<laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Atlantic Council. Is this on? I'm Jason Marzak, Deputy Director of the Adrian Arsh Latin America Center. And on behalf of our center, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today and enjoying our wonderful Colombian uh, breakfast spread. Uh, this is the, also the launch of our Columbia Initiative, and I'd like to thank the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Columbia Business Partnership for partnering with us. So the question is, why Columbia? Well, as, as probably many, many of you know, know in this room, Columbia is an amazing story of transformation. The Columbia of today would have been nearly impossible to imagine at the turn of the century. It's hard to name another country that has seen such profound socioeconomic and, of course, security improvements in such a short period of time. This is evidenced, of course, by the dramatic breakthrough, breakthrough in the peace process announced last week. Clearly, the lessons of Colombia go far beyond Colombia. Its achievements show what is possible for the region and for the world, and that's what we're here to do at the R Center, is talk about Latin America in a much broader global context. In Latin America, Colombia, an example of consolidated democratic institutions, active free press, an engaged civil society, a striking contrast to some of its neighbors. Membership in the Pacific Alliance has positioned it as a destination for foreign investment, and it is no surprise that Colombia is one of Latin America's top performers in the World Bank's annual doing business rankings. And of course, Colombia is also in the process of joining the OECD. What is the secret behind the, Colum the so-called Colombian miracle, and is it here to stay? And with peace now within reach, how will Colombia ready itself for this next crucial chapter in the country's history? These questions are front and center as Colombians go to the polls on October 25th to elect governors and mayors. And as our work in Colombia with the R Center begins a new chapter, we are here to begin to answer these questions today. Miguel Silva, in the first row, who will be on the panel today, is our non-resident senior Columbia fellow. Uh, he's been working with us to uh, implement this initiative, and he has a forthcoming report uh, that will explore not only Columbia's trans transformations, but also look at the many ingredients to, the, to its success, as, as well as recommendations for the next stage of Columbia, especially as it prepares to join the OECD and as it seeks to enter this process of building peace after dealing with issues such as trans transitional justice and political participation of ex-FARC. We're also here today because we recognize the work of President Juan Manuel Santos to achieve this, and it is no coincidence that this event is taking place just two days before the Atlantic Council honors President Santos with its Global Citizen Award at our annual gala in New York City. So we are fortunate here today to hear from top experts who have their hands on the pulse of the country. We are, of course, honored to welcome a true reformer, Mayor Elsa Noguera, uh, the mayor of Barranquilla, Colombia's fourth largest city, I mentioned our non-resident senior Columbia fellow, Miguel Silva, as well as Joaquin Cotani, the head uh, economist for Latin America and the Caribbean at Standard & Poor's, and Roberto Martinez, the head of the OECD Mexico and Latin America office. And you can also feel free to take out your phones as long as it's only for tweeting about this event. And if you do that, please use the hashtag ACColumbia. So with that, it's my pleasure to welcome via video, uh, because he's with the president in New York, Ambassador Juan Carlos Pinzon, who will connect with us via Skype. Ambassador Pinzon has an illustrious career as a public and private sector leader, serving as Minister of Defense for the last four years. He arrived in Washington only two months ago as ambassador, but he is no stranger to Washington, having spent much time here, whether at Johns Hopkins or at the World Bank. The ambassador will introduce Mayor Noguera, after she speaks, my colleague Peter Schechter, the center director, will moderate the panel and captain the remainder of the event. Thank you all for being here today. Ambassador Pizzo. Good morning to all. Thank you very much, and thank you, Jason, for that kind introduction of Colombia. Thank you all. Thank you very much for your introduction about me. Certainly, I regret not being able to be there in Washington person. But thanks to the modern technology, I'm able to go to the As you said, I'm here with President Santos for the United Nations General Assembly. And we'll be joining him on Thursday evening when he receives this very important Council's Global Citizen Award. Uh, I think that's going to be a very important uh, recognition and, as you said, very timely uh, for what is going on in current history. Peter and Jason, and to all of you at the Atlantic Council, thank you for all that you do for, to promote development, 
progress and prosperity in the Americas. You play a critical role in advancing dialogue and engagement on the challenges and opportunities facing the entire global community. And so it is an honor to be with you today to discuss Colombia's epic trans transformation. I would like to recognize the presence of the mayor of Barranquilla, Elsa Noguera. She's part of an energetic generation of Colombians, young, well-educated, committed with her nation. I know her since college and recognize her efforts to always step ahead of any constraint. The mayor represents exactly the thoughts I will share with you today. Barranquilla has undergone a positive transformation, making it one of the most thriving cities in Colombia. Mayor Novera has led important projects in infrastructure, healthcare, foreign direct investment, creating jobs and opportunities. She has also led crucial efforts with national police to provide security and further strengthening trust with communities. I was lucky to team up with her to enhance citizen security in her city. That is how you build peace. Congratulations, Mayor, for, for your successes. I would also like to thank Miguel Silva, an outstanding Colombian, for the report on Colombia's successes and challenges ahead that I understand he's working hard. I'm looking forward that are required to continue this transformation of Colombia. Also recognize all the members of uh, Joaquin Cotani from Standard Poor's, Roberto Martinez from the Center of uh, Latin America OECD, and Neil Harrington of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Uh, as you all have witnessed, Colombia has transformed remarkably over the past 15 years. Three successive administrations made tough decisions and took bold steps to restore security and stability strengthen democratic institutions, and advance social policies. All of their efforts, from President Pastrana to President Santos, have led to significant social progress and economic growth. 15 years ago, just 15 years ago, as you said, Colombia was nearly a failed state with the strong commitment and resilience of the people and leaders of Colombia. We were able to turn the page and we were not alone in our efforts to transform the country. In fact, Plan Colombia, a bilateral and bipartisan initiative with the United States, in many ways laid the foundation for the transformation of Colombia that was launched in 2000. The initiative certainly combated drug trafficking, looked to dismantle illegal armed groups, but certainly was integrated in the sense of looking for social progress and institutional progress. is by far one of the most important foreign policy successes in a generation. Today in Colombia, we're looking forward to the next 15 years on the economic front. We are well positioned for growth, even in the face of failing oil prices and global economic slowdown. Our outlook is promising. Colombia's economy is one of the few in Latin America with expected GDP growth above 3% this year and next. We also have been invited to become a member of the OECD, and we expect to exceed in 2016-2017. Last year, we attracted more than 50 billion foreign direct investment, a record level of investment, and we achieved 29.5% of GDP, which is a very very impressive investment rate. Our middle class is steadily growing, and today Colombia has the highest job creation rate in Latin America. Inequality, Gini coefficient has finally moved below 50 after almost 20 years. And poverty and extreme poverty has been cut by half in the past five years. Largest infrastructure program is happening as we speak. And from being the most violent country in the world 15 years ago, today we have the current lowest homicide per 100,000 uh, inhabitants rate in 35 years. To further move our economy and people forward on the path to prosperity, we must continue to strengthen the middle class by providing more job opportunities 
attracting investment and boosting commercial ties through trade initiatives like the Pacific Alliance, which we lead along with Chile, Mexico, and Peru, and the certainly Trans-Pacific Partnership, which we should be able to join. As we look ahead to the next 15 years, we know our next transformation will begin when we achieve lasting and sustainable peace. As you know, Colombia is embarking on a peace process aimed at ending a more than 50-year conflict with the FARC. We arrived to this point due to determination in combating the illegal armed groups in the country. And allow me to tell you that I can testify that it was thanks to our military and police forces, their sacrifice, their heroism, and their victories. That's how we are getting to peace. There is no doubt that this peace process is ambitious, but it must be given a chance to succeed. Just last week, President Santos announced an agreement reached on transitional justice, which is another step toward ending the conflict once and for all. The president was very clear, six months to sign the agreement to end the conflict. This is a historic breakthrough for Colombia. But the process will not simply end once an agreement is reached. There will be a post-conflict period, particularly in those marginal areas, and its success will in large part depend on a strong participation and regional governments in Colombia, from mayors to governors, like Mayor Elsa Noguera. Peace must be built at the local level, within communities. And while our focus remains on issues of domestic concern, we are equally committed to addressing the challenges and opportunities facing the region and the world. We will continue to play an important and expansive role in security cooperation and the regional and global levels in efforts to root our, trans our, our transnational crime to mitigate the impacts of climate change and to leverage technology and innovation as tools for social change, among other priorities. This week in New York City, at this General Assembly, under leadership of President Santos, we are engaging up to 5,000 out of the 40,000 that other 70 countries are in climate change, establishing a reduction of emissions goal of 20% for 2030 joining other countries like Brazil, Germany, Sweden, U.S. and China on this effort, and on the Sustainable Development Goals, including its metrics in our own National Development Plan, and joining the U.K., the U.S., and other nations in a close follow-up of this process. As we look back, back on our transformation and then ahead to the next 15 years, we can say with certainty that Colombia has come a long way, and our best days are in the Ahead. Thank you very much, and good luck, Gilt. Everyone, I want to start thanking Atlantic Council and Peter for inviting me to participate in this great event to tell you about Barranquilla's transformation. In January uh, 2008, when I uh, arrived uh, to the mayor's office as a secretary of finance, we had many, many difficulties. But let me first tell you about Barranquilla. We are located on, a, on the northern coast of Colombia in a very strategic geographical location. We are at the best corner of Latin America. We are exactly at the point where the Magdalena River, our main waterway, meets with the Caribbean Sea. We have a population of 
a million citizens in the city and 2.2 in the metropolitan area. And we are the fourth and largest city of Colombia, but today we have a, a, high, a, you know, a great a economic a development a potential growth. So as I was telling you, Barranquilla, uh, today it's a, uh, a study case. And we have become a, a, the hope for many cities that today have huge problems and difficulties as we used to have eight years ago. When I joined the mayor's office staff as his secretary of finance, we had to face a city with um, all kinds of problems, especially we were in bankruptcy, in like in Lake 550, it's like chapter 11 here in the US. And we also have a administrative inefficiency. We were very weak, our institutionality. We had corruption problems. And what was worse, our citizens didn't trust in uh, the mayor's office staff. Therefore, we had no other option but to put the house in order. And we adopted a modern, efficient, and transparent uh, model, such as uh, President Santos has adopted a model based on good government and governance, which uh, has been essential uh, to gain uh, the inter uh, national um, community and investors' confidence to reinforce the uh, peace uh, process and also to bring more investment to Colombia. We in the local government, we also uh, recover or regain that confidence, especially from uh, our citizens, from national government, from banks, and uh, from you know everyone. In fact, uh, in the last uh, report of transfer, uh, this NGO, uh, Transparencia por Colombia, that it's an appendix of international transparency, uh, Barranquilla was put out as the city with the uh, lowest risk uh, of corruption, with the city with the lowest risk of, of corruption in Colombia. Therefore, during these past eight years, we almost tripled our total income. So we start investing in reducing social gaps and um, improving our city's competitiveness. One of uh, the main challenge that has assumed President Santos is to reduce extreme poverty and uh, poverty levels. According to the Statistic National Department of Colombia, Col uh, our country is uh, successful, successfully achieving uh, this uh, goal to reduce poverty. And Barranquilla has been a great partner to achieve this purpose. In only three years, comparing 2014 versus 2011, our city has reduced it in 32% extreme poverty and 27% poverty levels. And we uh, were able to achieve this reduction because we are investing in basic needs of our citizens, especially the poorest family. We are making a great efforts to offer a very good healthcare service, opportune and high quality and excellent facilities. We're also attending uh, integrally uh, 40,000 uh, children from zero to five years old, <coughs> giving them a very good early child education. We have also uh, achieved many improvements in quality of our public education investing in free meals, in technologies, uh, in uh, better infrastructures of our school, 
it, uh, teachers training and extending the um, school hours. We want our students to be more time or more hours at school and, and less time in the streets. But we also see a great um, alliance with the national government to build 10,400 housing units with this great program that President Santos has to give houses to the poorest family, free houses to the poorest family, but also he is giving the opportunity for those families that earns between one and two minimum salaries to uh, have a house, but uh, at lower prices. This uh, has a, a help a lot in to achieve that purpose of reducing poverty level. But it has also been a, a great opportunity to generate a, a jobs and employment of, a, for people that do not have any education. But we, such as the central government, know that we do not only reduce poverty by uh, attending the uh, by attending uh, uh, basic needs. We also have to generate the conditions of a competitive country, a competitive city, to attract more investment in order to uh, to uh, to offer those uh, employment and entrepreneur uh, opportunities. Uh, I only have one minute, and I'm, I'm going <laughs> to try to say, this uh, uh, government is making great investment in a ambitious, in ambitious road and transportation uh, infrastructure plan without precedent in the history of our a country, but it has also signed these free trade agreements with the U.S., with the Europe, uh, Korea, and other countries in order to increase the commerce. Those are strategies to uh, bring more business to the country to be able to generate those jobs opportunity. And in Barranquilla, the national government is uh, investing well in highways, in a new airport, but especially in the uh, navigation infrastructure of Rio Magdalena. What the government wants is to adopt the um, uh, multimodal system to use the river as a way of transportation in order to reduce uh, internal costs. And all of these uh, investments uh, are letting the, the, the country to uh, achieve very good results in reducing uh, unemployment rate. Barranquilla has also been a great partner in this purpose. We are uh, in the two cities uh, with the lowest unemployment rate for the past three years. And uh, I believe that with all this investment, with the peace process or, or peace agreement, that it's very close to be signed. And all the effort that it's making our uh, central government and local governments to reduce poverty and social gaps, open up many you know, great opportunities for the country and the cities. But if we really get to sign the peace agreement, for sure we will be having much more and better opportunities for everyone. Thank you so much.
Thank you, Mayor, for that great, uh, great introduction to Barranquilla. All of us who follow Colombia know about your great uh, successes. Good morning, everybody. I'm Peter Schechter. I'm the director of the Adrian Ars Latin America program. I just, just a personal word to start with. This, uh, this subject, Colombia, is a subject that's near and dear to my heart. I began working in Colombia in 1988 as a political consultant. And since then, I've had the honor of working for five heads of state and on many, many election efforts in Colombia. I've been polling in Colombia for nearly three decades. When I published my first novel, it was about a woman president of Colombia who saved the world. I counted my passport entries in various passports that I've had over these years, and the numbers of entries and exits into and from Colombia number over 100. So this country uh, and this place is a, con is a place that I hold near and dear, and it is a very, very special country. Therefore, it's an enormous pleasure to be here with a panel of all-stars to talk about what has been happening in Colombia, what have been the successes, what have been the challenges, and most importantly, what's going to happen in the future. Few people are better equipped to do that job than the four people who've kindly agreed to come here and chat with us this morning. Now, I've already told them, but I want to tell them in public, that the less you hear of me, the happier I'm going to be. I want this to be informal. I want it to be animated. I would love for you to disagree with each other. And the less of me is going to be better. So let me just quickly introduce Dr. Joaquin Cotani, Chief Economist for Latin America at Standard & Poor's, who's had an extensive career in public and private sector. He's previously served as Undersecretary of Macroeconomic Policy and Undersecretary of Finance in Argentina, and then came to Washington as Argentina's financial representative at the embassy. You've already heard from the great mayor of Barranquilla, Elsa Noguera, uh, and without repeating the ambassador's praise, I just want to point out that in addition to all that she's done for her city in Barranquilla, perhaps most importantly is that her influence does not end at the city's limits. She has had an enormously successful national career and I'm sure, uh, having worked in Colombia, that we've not heard the end of Mayor Noera's uh, impact on national politics. Uh, Roberto Martinez, thank you for coming from Mexico. He's the head of the Center for Latin America and Mexico at the OECD. He specializes in public policy and competitiveness and has served as the advisor uh, to the Secretary of Communications during Mexico's very important reforms in telecommunications, broadcasting, and economic competition. And last but not least, Miguel Silva is our non-resident Colombia fellow. Miguel is a Colombian journalist, a lawyer, a consultant. He's the founder of Galileo 6, a strategic communications firm specializing in crisis management and political consulting. And Miguel has advised campaigns in, and presidents in Colombia, Panama, Peru, Argentina, and was chief of staff to President Gaviria for many years. Any similarity between each other, even though we look a bit the same, is um, if people say that we're twins when we're together, he's the older twin. <laughs> Last, I'm also so pleased that uh, the US Chamber of Commerce and the US Columbia Business Partnership has decided to partner with us, and that Neil Harrington, the Chamber's Executive Director for the Americas, has agreed to give us a few closing words uh, at, the, at the end of our, at the end of our uh, meeting. So let me, let me just, what I want to do today is try to set the stage. I know that everybody wants to talk about peace in the future, but I want to set the stage about where Colombia also has come from and what has been the, 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 the secret sauce about its success. And I began working, as I said, in Colombia in 1988, where everything was dark. We did a poll, and everything was dark, and people were negative and pessimistic, and our kids' lives would be worse than our life. So Miguel, let me start with you, because you're preparing our report, which we'll publish uh, in, in the next weeks. What we're seeing in Colombia today, is it a miracle? I mean, what has, what has been the unique ingredients of Colombia's success over the last years? Well, I would go back to uh, 1988. There was only one thing that was not dark. And there was this consensus of the need for political change and political reform. It had been tried in 1979. It had been tried all throughout the 80s. And finally, in the 1991 Constitution, the Constitutional Assembly, it happened. 
Uh, and I think the secret sauce, as you call it, uh, for uh, what I think could be called a miracle is that consensus, spoken and unspoken. Because if you look at the different types of consensus that we've had over time, you will see that we've had an unspoken uh, economic, ortho economic orthodoxy, uh, a consensus around that, which is unspoken. Nobody has signed any papers. Uh, and then we have, I would say, a more uh, uh, spoken consensus on social matters uh, and the need to reduce poverty, as Elsa was uh, saying. Um, so I, I will just read a couple of uh, statistics, uh, very much in the line of the ambassador, just to tell you how everything has changed. And it's very short. GDP times four from 2000 to 2010. We move from 30, the, the position 39 of the list of countries by GDP of the IMF from 39 to 31 in that period of time. Poverty has fallen from 50 to 29%. That's 2.5 million people joining the middle class in the recent years. FDI, the uh, foreign direct investment in 1990, in those dark years, we had uh, $2 billion in foreign direct investment. We had $16 billion in 2014. Now, security, kidnappings down 92%, homicides in half, guerrilla attacks down 73%, militants of the FARC, they had 22,000 people in 2000, they have 7,000 right now. And just a couple of other statistics, healthcare, it was 20% in 1993, now it's 90%. Huge quality issues, as Elsa mentioned, but it's 90%. Uh, Education, primary and secondary, is free right now in Colombia. It used to be just a political, influential. Uh, if you didn't have political influences, you wouldn't get your child in, in school. And then water, access to water, 78 to 92 percent. Sewage, 61 to 85 percent. Electricity, 75 to 94 percent. It's all, and if you go to Medellin, which was the capital of crime in the, in, in the hemisphere, is now the capital for innovation. I mean, I, I do think it can be called a miracle. And I do think that the secret sauce has been a certain level of consensus on how to do have a collective purpose on those three uh, issues. So, Mayor, you know, I, I want to pick up on this issue of consensus, and I want to, I want to. You've, you've talked about Barranquilla, and I'm now going to try to piggyback on your national view. If uh, you know, tell us a little bit about this consensus. Uh, do you think, first of all, the most important thing is? Is the consensus continuing to exist? I mean, everybody knows that there's been some considerable divide in Colombia about where Colombia is going on a number of levels. But do you see the consensus as continuing to exist over the, over the, over the future? Well, I believe that since we had consensus, we could achieve all those uh, improvements uh, Mr. Silva just told us. But now, maybe if you are a uh, in Colombia and outside, you may have this uh, sensation that we do not have consensus. But this polarization is due to the skepticism of the peace process. It's, um, you know, our, our citizens were very skeptic with uh, the real uh, intentions of the guerrilla because during this period they uh, has not they you know they, they keep on uh, making crimes so we were very skeptic about it but since the last um, meeting in La Habana last week hope is back and now uh, everyone knows the citizens in Colombia and uh, in the international community that we're gonna sign a peace, but without impunity. That all these uh, terrible crimes and violations of human rights are gonna be punished, punished. But I do believe that we have consensus in other issues, such as the important to reduce uh, poverty or social gaps, because it's um, what causes violence. When we have such inequalities, it, that produces violence in our country. And the polarization, as I said, I believe it, it, it was because of uh, the um, perception our citizens have 
uh, because of the peace uh, process. And I believe that it's normal that they feel that way because we had different attempts and failures in the past, but today things are much different. We have a country with a, a, a great um, credibility, and an example of that is that the U.S. sent a special envoy to participate in this negotiation process, but also we have a, a very strong army. And we have to give the, the, the credits to our ambassador. He did a, a great job as Minister of Defense. And our guerrilla today, it's very weak. So it's really interest for them to sign this uh, peace agreement. Therefore, I believe that when we sign the, um, the peace agreement, we will be needing a consensus to, uh, for the citizens to accept what, what was uh, agreed in, in La Habana. Uh, that's what President Santo has offered to, to our citizens, and I believe that uh, he's going to find that consensus. So Joaquin, let me, let me ask you, um, and as, I, as we turn a little bit to the economic, I mean, there has been clearly, Miguel recited a whole litany of statistics, which has emanated from this consensus that our two Colombian friends have talked to us about. And so economically, where is Colombia today? I mean, it has it clearly has come from quite far, FDI in, increasing. Uh, it continues to do amazingly well on all the rankings and the doing business rankings. So where do you see Colombia today in terms of its ability both to attract foreign investment and to continue to implement the, the right economic policies as we move to the future? Well, Colombia is in a good place um, to withstand uh, the effects of um, the global deceleration that we are seeing today uh, that is impacting uh, the region. Uh, but when you look at the different um, uh, countries in Latin America, Colombia is probably the strongest one uh, uh, in terms of uh, the initial conditions. I mean, Chile and Peru probably uh, compare uh, with uh, Colombia. But there, uh, you see more um, of an upside uh, in Colombia than in other places because of uh, a, the infrastructure, because of the dividend of peace in general uh, that started um, a, in the last decade, uh, but is continuing. is a, is an ongoing process uh, that um, hasn't yielded all the uh, dividends that are expected. So infrastructure, the, the 4G plan uh, is, is huge uh, in terms of the potential impact uh, and uh, uh, the improvements that we had seen in, in social uh, indicators. Uh, there are challenges, obviously. Uh, there are challenges everywhere in Latin America. Uh, the mayor was uh, mentioning uh, inequality and, and it's a regional problem. Uh, uh, Latin America is not the region of the world where poverty uh, is uh, the highest. That goes to uh, Southeast Asia, in fact, um, but is uh, the region with the most uh, inequality. Uh, and, and of course, uh, Colombia is not an exception uh, uh, to that. Uh, but the, uh, unlike other places where the um, indicators are deteriorating in Colombia, uh, they are improving. Now, uh, the oil shock is, is a challenge. It's something that um, nobody knows for sure how long uh, it's going to last because there are um, supply and uh, demand uh, problems involved. There is China and there is, of course, uh, the um, appearance of new uh, supply uh, sources. 
um, oil uh, together with security and together uh, with uh, macroeconomic uh, stability were the three uh, big uh, successes that make uh, Colombia different uh, from, say, uh, the 90s. And oil brought not only uh, uh, you know, revenues uh, for, for, uh, for the economy, for, for the government, but a lot of uh, FDI is linked uh, uh, to that. Uh, so we have to be prepared to see, uh, you know, slower growth as in uh, uh, any other part uh, of the world, I would say. Uh, but because Colombia has been uh, had the the vision of um, of uh, signing uh, agreements uh, with the U.S. with uh, Europe with, uh, and, and soon I think uh, they will. Uh, be part of the TPP uh, as well. Um, they are prepared uh, to really uh, move um, uh, to increase uh, exports that in the past Colombia was uh, good at, but that had declined because of the strength of the currency. And uh, so, so there is uh, there is a lot that uh, that we will expect. Uh, Colombia to deliver in the next few years. So I think that's a great segue to me for me to ask Lorento. In the next few years, one of the things that Colombia is expected to deliver is accession to the OECD. Uh, you were telling us before about the different possible names for the OECD. Some people call it the rich man's club. Other people call it the good policy club. Um, and so I, I'm curious. Tell us a little bit about what this accession entails, because I think it's a interesting how the government might also use this accession to try to make some of the adjustments that it needs to make. Okay, so, uh, so on behalf of, of the Organization for Economic uh, Development and Cooperation, it's, uh, it's an honor to be here. Uh, very glad to share this, this space with a uh, very uh, with a with a plural view and um, excellent uh, um, fellow panelists, so um, I would like to just recall that the OECD accession process is a rigorous technical assessment of, in this case, of Colombia's legislation, policies, and practices in a wide array of areas, from investment to environment, public governance to agriculture. So uh, so far, uh, roughly 23. Uh, OECD tech, uh, expert committees have looked into a wide array of uh, policies ranging from agriculture, telecommunications, um, tax policy, uh, social development, uh, territorial development. And so the purpose of that is to, to uh, assess to what extent the OECD or um, Colombia is uh, in line with OECD standards and, and policies. So in that sense, I think Colombia has, has, um, has already uh, gone through a very good um, assessment process. Um, in, um, as we speak, there's been uh, an in-depth uh, dialogue between my expert colleagues and, uh, and Colombian authorities on a number of key policy and legislative areas. Um, the, the, the goal of this uh, dialogue is to make sure that Colombia and the Colombian authorities uh, have a commitment to bring Colombia in line with, the, with OECD policy standards and guidelines. Uh, some people sometimes tend to think that there's uh, somewhat, there's uh, an over-prescriptive uh, attitude of the OECD or that there's, there might be uh, conditions or some uh, strong conditionality for Colombia in order to, to access the OECD. And I would like to stress that it is uh, only, um, it is true that the OECD makes recommendations, but it's up to the Colombian government to decide on how and to and with uh, with the the pace at which uh, Colombia can uh, can 
can get closer to the OECD standards. So in that sense, I think that uh, what, what's key to this process is that Colombia reveals or proves its commitment to a set of key policies, to, uh, to uh, alignment with uh, key OECD standards, to compliance with some uh, key OECD guidelines. And so in that sense, um, the final uh, decision of, as to whether Colombia is ready to access the OECD is, uh, um, belongs to the country, the Council of, of, of OECD country, uh, member countries. So it's 34 countries. And so in that sense, it's not just a board, a small team of experts that decides whether, the, whether, whether Colombia is ripe for, acce uh, for accession. It's more about uh, proving that there's uh, consistency, that there's commitment, that there's predictability in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the way that Colombia wishes to join what I call not the rich countries club, but rather the club of best practices, or in my own language, uh, the club of the best, uh, the best effort. And so in that sense, as I was saying before, uh, one of the lessons of the, of the endur enduring e global economic crisis is that there's no one single path to economic growth and that uh, higher income countries can learn as much from uh, middle income countries or uh, middle lower income countries than everyone else because the challenge is everyone's challenge to reactivate the global economy. And so in that sense, I think the OECD is a factory of innovative policy solutions. Thank you. I think that, that, can I just stay on this to Roberto with you and, and Joaquin? Um, I mean, part of this, the innovation that's necessary in the changing world economy is clearly the changing game of trade. And we're, you mentioned it quickly that Colombia is excluded from the TPP at the moment. How, how is this the exclusion going to affect its ability to implement some of the uh, reforms it needs is, will FDI levels, do you suspect that they will drop? And does the Colombian membership in the Pacific Alliance rebalance the issue that it's not part of the TPP? Um, well, I think that uh, uh, entrance to the TP, uh, TPP is, is a matter of time. Uh, it's just not a uh, Colombia who uh, uh, doesn't want to be a part. They, they, they always express the clear um, intention and, and, and desire to, uh, to be part. I think there are technical delays that are related more to the partners uh, and, and not even the U.S. Um, as such, uh, but um, the group of Asian countries that um, uh, wanted uh, at the beginning and, and, and perhaps uh, for a uh, purpose of uh, being uh, more expeditious uh, uh, not to incorporate other countries. Uh, and my impression is that uh, President Obama wants, uh, you know, is, is in a rush to um, uh, sign uh, uh, the treaty because of, um, you know, this competition that the, there is with, uh, with China in, in the advances for geopolitical uh, uh, positioning. Uh, and uh, once this is done, they will accept other members, and I think Colombia is first in line uh, to join. But um, much of what has happened in terms of trade, uh, and we, we, we see um, that one of the main problems, if you look at the macroeconomic picture of Colombia, is the current account deficit, um, has to do uh, with, uh, again, the, the, the super cycle of commodities, which was a good thing. But as, as it always happens, it displaces other sectors uh, in the economy, the non-traditional exports that uh, on which Colombia used to be, you know, one of the most uh, diversified countries, thanks to the stability, precisely, of the exchange rate. Now, that change as it changed everywhere else because of the sudden um, uh, impact of, of China and the world economy and increasing commodity prices, uh, the exploration of all all good things, but. Uh, the, the, the economy is, is, is a dynamic place, 
uh, perhaps all the fruits of the uh, past bilateral agreements, including with the uh, US, uh, haven't materialized uh, yet. But because of that, because of uh, you know finding the niches, uh, and now that things are reversing in terms of you know uh, the, the Colombian peso has has depreciated uh, a lot, perhaps more than it deserves. Um, it, but that is, as, as, as Minister Cardenas has said, this is a, it's a blessing in, in a way. I mean, it, it has cost in the short term because um, uh, you know, the standard of living of people usually decline when that happens. But then it creates opportunities that, uh, given the position, the, the, uh, the proximity uh, uh, with the United States, not geographically only, but, but uh, in terms of uh, you know, uh, partnership and, and, and politics, uh, it's going to, I'm sure that uh, we will see a country less dependent on oil and again successful at producing other things. Roberto, please. Yeah, well, uh, just about, uh, just commenting on the, the uh, strategic options open to Colombia, uh, and I think there's an, an interesting intersection, of course, in the facing this scenario of Colombia uh, joining the OECD and also belonging to the Pacific Alliance. It's, interest, it's interesting just to see that for, uh, I, I've been uh, attending some meetings with uh, Mexican officials um, and then they, they have commented on, on Colombia's uh, possible accession to the OECD and, the, the, and then the fact that Chile is also an OECD member and then they, they are vocal and they seem to be very enthusiastic about the prospects of aligning criteria across Chile and uh, Mexico and also Colombia to within the OECD, if that were the case. Well, that's what we expect. Um, to have a, like a stronger or more solid uh, joint coordination in a number of key strategic policy areas. And so in that sense, there, there, there might be, I see, an interplay between uh, strategic coordination across countries um, in the, within the OECD as well as uh, within the Pacific Alliance. And so, and so that's, that's, I think that's going to be, that will open more options to the Colombian government um, to the benefit of uh, more uh, visible and uh, a more uh, solid uh, Colombian position in international fora. Okay. Miguel, let's, let's move to what happened last week and the peace process. Uh, it's something I'm sure everybody wants to, wants to talk about. I mean, it's certainly one of the unfinished businesses that remains. It's something that President Santos has banked to a large extent his presidency on the peace process. Uh, what happened last week, was that a complete surprise? And what were the contributing factors to it happening? And is this, does this mean that we can really count on peace happening uh, by March 23rd, 2016, as the, president, as the president mentioned? And tell us a little bit, if you could, also about what, what were the <coughs> issues involved in the agreement of transitional justice? Well, it's a lot of questions, I yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm not an expert in the peace process, but a couple of things to say before. Uh, there's still some uh, road to travel, and with the FARC, you never know how long that road has to be traveled. Uh, they have no sense of time. They're like Japanese negotiators. They, they don't care about time. <laughs> and they don't care about political costs. So those two elements of a negotiation are not there. So uh, they both talked about March, but there's still things that they have to uh, negotiate. Now, what happened was crucial, I think, was very, very important because it's justice, transitional justice, and an agreement on that is, is very, very important. There are still some things that need to be taken care of, and magistrates, uh, both from Colombia and international, um, that will look at reparation, truth, uh, non-repetition, and no impunity, um, uh, and, uh, repar and victim reparation. Um, there is um, a level of amnesty for political crimes, no amnesty for war crimes. Um, it's not only about the FARC, it's about everyone who committed uh, crimes related to the armed conflict. 
Of course, the extreme right is saying, so now everybody's going to be judged. And, and the fiscal has, I think, uh, gone beyond his uh, uh, limits. Uh, but it, it is about the armed conflict. And no magistrate can judge anyone for a crime uh, unrelated to the armed conflict. Uh, two, two other things that I think are, are critical. Uh, the, the whole agreement, the whole September 23rd agreement, is about truth and, and, and the need for, for the guerrillas to confess. So if you do confess your crimes, uh, you get five to eight years in a um, secure place uh, with vigilance. That's what the government, the two words that the government has used. Um, but if you do not confess, you can get up to 20 years in jail. So I think that uh, is a guarantee for one of the essential parts of a peace process, which is to learn from that and, and never repeat it. Uh, there's going to be restrictions to liberty for those guys. There's, uh, it's unsaid, but I think everybody has talked about this, no extradition, which happened with the paramilitaries. Uh, and then there's still the, the issue of political participation. How will that happen? That's still unwritten. So, uh, I mean, it, it was very important what happened because it, I think it was the, the most difficult negotiation element in the peace process, but there's still a path to, to travel. Mayor Nogueira, I'm, I'm curious as to your view on where we're going on peace, but in particular, tell us, you, you've spoken so eloquently about how uh, the improvements in Colombia have helped your city and how your city has also holds lessons at the national level. W what's the peace bonus that you're going to get? What is the peace dividend that you expect? Should this be successful with all the caveats that Miguel mentioned? But should this be successful? Is there a peace dividend for Barranquilla and other cities? We believe that with the peace agreement, uh, our opportunities, especially in uh, economic development, to bring more investment to the country and to the city, to increase our international commerce, uh, will be benefited with the agreement. The, the Last time with the uh, paramilitares, uh, was that uh, the head of these groups went to jail or had uh, some kind of negotiation, but the basis of these structures uh, organized in uh, criminal bands and went to the principal cities of Colombia. So uh, today our citizens in, this, uh, in the cities feel insecure because we have these uh, backrims, as they call them in, in Colombia. So what I uh, believe that we have to work from the local government with the national government is to uh, de uh, improve the security in the cities working with the, the police. We need to strengthen our police. We now have a very strong um, army forces. They are doing a great job. Uh, but uh, fighting and defeating the, the guerrillas and narco-traffic uh, war. But we need to strengthen uh, the operating capacity of our police forces. We need more policemen to uh, provide a better security at the cities. But it's not only uh, uh, policemen. We need also a, a good justice. There's nothing that motivates more uh, violence and insecurity than when there's no, uh, when, when there's impunity. And we also have to, uh, to solve the problems we have in our jails. They are overcrowded, the infrastructure it's in a, uh, are terrible, uh, so we could have our jails to be correctional centers. So more than, well, opportunities, we have them all, especially because there's going to be more confidence in the international community, in our investors. But I believe that there's a challenge in securities of our cities that we have to work on. Thank you. If I can add, uh, there is another dimension of the the, the peace dividend uh, 
is a long-term dividend. Uh, it, but some people have been raising doubts about also, and from an economic point of view, the, the fiscal costs uh, that are more short term. Um, but then Colombia is not an over-indebted country. Of course, um, it's a very, uh, probably the most, I wouldn't say the one with the better, uh, the best um, fiscal indicators, but the, the uh, one in which uh, the, the will of um, the policymakers is so fiscally conservative that sometimes uh, it's, uh, it's striking uh, relative to other places in the region. And I would dare to say that uh, in something so important as, um, as pacifying a nation that has its long-term dividends, there is room uh, for uh, you know, paying some costs, um, even if that means uh, uh, raising the public debt. But if I said that in uh, in front of the Minister of Finance, he would get really upset <laughs> with this. Well, and, and President Santo always says that it, the war it, it costs a, 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 a lot of budget, and now we can use that budget For to peace. reduce uh, social gaps. Correcto. Yeah, I, I, yes, I think there's, uh, there's a key point uh, that has been made about opportunity, room for opportunity in the case of Colombia. And I do, and I do think that's part of what the OECD has um, shared and that after its um, assessment process. And on the fiscal side, um, there's, there's quite some room for, uh, for Colombia, for, for the Colombian authorities to make more of out of fiscal policy, to make it more progressive, to make uh, fiscal policy a key instrument for social development and for inclusion. And so in that regard, there's a number of things that the OECD has recommended, and I recall the OECD Economic Review of Colombia, and so the, the recommendations, the observations are there for, every, for everyone to see as to how Colombia could uh, simplify its, uh, its uh, fiscal revenue policy, how it could, uh, and that's a challenge that, that is common to many Latin American countries, how it could tackle informality, how it could, how the Colombian authorities, fiscal authorities could um, make sure that the, the tax revenue is in, increased and enhanced. Uh, there's a number of um, tax exemptions uh, in the fiscal, uh, in the Colombian fiscal systems that are not as uh, necessary as some people would think. And so if, uh, and there's also the issue that fiscal policy in Colombia, so it, it's uh, taxing corporate, uh, corporate earnings heavily. And so that's uh, remarkable in, in the sense that if you have, um, if you tax uh, corporate income, then you are lowering incentives for, in for investment. And, uh, and you could do more if you could expand the, the, tax, the taxable uh, um, um, population. You could improve your, uh, your VAT, VAT policy. More people could pay taxes. Uh, you could, if you do away with some exemptions, you can, you can make sure that if this uh, elimination of exemptions if, if that were to hit lower income families, you can still uh, compensate for, for that, focusing your uh, policies to the more the, the vulnerable uh, segments of the population. And you, you can still make more out of the fiscal policy. You can raise more taxes, hit less the, the, the more vulnerable, uh, hit less um, the uh, enterprises, those who uh, make the Colombian economy grow. And so in that sense, you can prove uh, the way that Colombia has over the last um, years that uh, there's a Colombia momentum uh, where there's, a, there's very good room for economic inclusive growth. Let me, let me ask, I think that's a, I, I, one of the questions that I had was just about taxes. So one thing, I've heard this from a lot of sources that the whole the tax mm -hmm. issues are um, 
important and need to be need to be modified. One thing is political theory, the other uh, economic theory. The other one is political reality. And M Mayor Noveda, would you just comment on? Is it? I mean, there is some considerable animosity these days and tension between the president and some of the major business uh, groups on this issue of taxes in particular. Is this, is this solvable? Are we, is, there, is the government able to get beyond this? I believe we, we're going to be able to, to solve that problem. But uh, our uh, business uh, sector or private sector, it's very afraid of this uh, new reform that the national government is planning to make. But we have a, a great team working on, on that. And what we want is a legislation that, it, 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 that, um, that can ha it be competitive. So we have taxes, but not only the same ones always paying taxes. We have to find a way to increase the base. companies, the base, right, the companies and the people paying taxes because we need taxes. We need a, a income to, to be able to make all the investment in, for needed people and to build a, a, a more just a country with a, a less a, a decision made the, in order to increase our revenues or our, our nation incomes but not only but in Colombia. Uh, well, as a country that uh, to the political uh, rise. I'm to the teeth. <laughs> it's, a, it's a scary place to be in. Um, I, I think we, we have to avoid getting into the political fiction of the Venezuelan crisis because uh, President Maduro is creating a fiction that is badly needed for him for the December elections to stop them, to avoid doing them, I think, um, or to try to rebalance uh, the polls. It's 80-20 right now, so he will most probably so he's created this fiction. This fiction, it weren't so scary. Uh, this fiction, for example, says that there are hundreds of thousands of Colombians fleeing Colombia to go to Venezuela, this paradise of economic uh, opportunity. And you know, we all laugh, but people in Venezuela might uh, believe that. And uh, those fictions, those Stalinist fictions, uh, can become realities. And I think avoiding the, the, uh, the trap of entering that fiction, of entering that narrative, even of considering that narrative a narrative that you should talk about, I think it's a big challenge because you have your own public opinion that will tell you, well, come on, what are you doing about this? Uh, so it's this balance between being firm and, and, and at the same time just knowing that you're, you're dealing with a madman, uh, that, that I think should be the defining elements of a very difficult foreign policy. Thank you. Let me open up to the audience for questions. Please identify yourself and raise your hand, and I'll thank you. Over there, there's a mic coming to you. Uh, Patricia Fagan, Georgetown University. Thank you. This has been a very uh, interesting debate among you, or discussion among you. You don't really disagree all that much. We, I don't think, we, um, the elections are forthcoming, the local elections are forthcoming. Territorial development is one of the major goals of the peace process, and as we have heard of the OECD as well. We have also heard that Barranquilla is making very encouraging progress with good goals in mind for the future. So I want to ask about the rest of the territories, the parts of Colombia that perhaps are not doing so well, especially the parts of Colombia, the territories, the, prov the provinces, the departments, in the former conflict zone, I'm saying former conflict zone with hope. Um, economically, how are they doing and what kind of progress do you foresee in the forthcoming, well, in, in the near future, near and medium future? Thank you. Who would like to take that? Me. 
<laughs> well, I'll, I'll start by saying a couple of things. One is, uh, I think it's a very relevant question because, it, as you know, our territory is huge and there are huge differences. Um, uh, so I would say that uh, the oil regions are in, in a difficult moment uh, and they're, they're struggling. Uh, they, they were used to get uh, enormous royalties and they're getting now half, 40% of that. Uh, so, so I think that's, those are regions that are very badly hit. Uh, then you have the southern parts of the country that have poverty issues far more. And the OECD, by the way, has spoken a lot about regional inequalities. Um, I, I recommend their report that they published in January or February about Colombia. It's, it's fantastic. Um, now, the problem is that regional elections are, uh, will not tell you a lot about the national, what happened. Uh, in October 29, we won't be able to say, you know, the opposition won or the government won or because there's a lot of coalitions and, and every, everybody's blending uh, in a different way. In, uh, you'll see the vice president helping someone in Bogota, the president helping somebody else, and then they're both together in the governorship of Antioquia. Uh, and, you know, and I think that the big divide in, in those elections is, is, is a it's a terrible divide between corrupt politicians and, and clean politicians. And I don't think the national government played a um, good moral teaching role on this one. They decided to play a pragmatical role. And so we'll see in many places mayors that uh, uh, we will be embarrassed uh, having them as mayors or governors. Uh, I hope that uh, at least Half of them will look like Elsa uh, and, and will govern like she did, uh, but uh, you know it can happen the other way around. So, what I can add is that um, Barranquilla and many other cities that have achieved uh, important uh, results have become like the hope for many other cities in Colombia. They are seeing that in, in short time, you can build uh, different cities and that when we have a, like good governments or, or and governance, a confidence is back. And the national government 80 years ago didn't want to have anything with Barranquilla and now is our best partner we have. He's, the national or central government is investing in, in many programs and infrastructure in the city. So uh, what this a good experience, as it was in Bogota a couple of years ago with Bocus and, and Peñalosa, uh, great mayors we have there. Uh, they, well, um, some others, uh, Fajardo, like good mayors, they have been like um, a reference to the rest of, of the cities of Colombia. Everybody <coughs> wants this question. Yeah, you, uh, you really uh, started a trend here. <laughs> I don't know much about um, uh, Colombian politics, but I want to throw an idea that I read somewhere that uh, sounded interesting, but I want to uh, know the opinion of the experts here. Uh, in analysts, it was saying that uh, actually this regional election may decide uh, much of uh, what will happen in the presidential election because uh, of uh, the vice president uh, campaigning uh, uh, heavily in order to get uh, more uh, regional uh, support and in the small cities uh, with uh, you know, leveraging from the housing program and uh, the infrastructure program and then the opposition that probably is more established in the regions and I guess they mentioned Partido de la U or others uh, trying to counteract that from Congress and, and so it, it's you know, who uh, gets more votes uh, will be uh, interesting to, as a predictor of what could happen. Is that, is that? <laughs> it's going to be very difficult because of the coalitions. So the problem is that in, in the next day, everybody will say, I won. Right. Because there, there are so many coalitions that they can say, mm -hmm. you can add those numbers in many different ways. Okay. For, let me, let see, me. No, for example, they, they the mayor, that they, or the candidate that that's running for mayor uh, in Barranquilla, all the parties are with him. So it's a great coalition. 
Other questions, please? Take the gentleman here. <laughs> Hi, my name is Kunal Rawal. I'm uh, from George Washington University, and this question is for Joaquin and Roberto. Um, do you think during the economic sup this commodity super cycle, all the money that is being received by the government has it been spent properly in the fundamental sectors like higher education, skill development, such that the economy has is you know once you come in TPP, it's okay to come in TPP, but has the economy or the private sector competitive enough to compete with other economies of Asian countries? Okay, so first of all, thank you for the free publicity about the, the OECD work uh, on Colombia. It's true that there's been a number of interesting things that have been highlighted as both uh, areas of opportunity but also strengths of Colombia in the present context of, uh, and it, of course, the challenges ahead in terms of regional development. Um, whether about, about Colombia's prospects for uh, economic growth and for, as I, as, I, as I mentioned before, one of the things is to make sure that uh, investors in Colombia have enough incentives to keep investing and to invest more. Uh, there could be less of a tax burden uh, placed on companies, on Colombian companies. Uh, and no doubt that there's a lot to be done in terms of, and there's a good area of improvement in, in, in the regulatory reform uh, arena. Uh, my colleagues have already been working with, uh, with Colombian authorities on that. One of the key things also to keep to, to bear in mind in terms of like, like after the elections and all, and, 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 and that, the, one of the, uh, one of the areas of where you can get the most out of uh, regulatory reform is, this, uh, is at the subnational level. So there's a number of important things that subnational governments can do and mayors can do to improve the business environment. So going back to the second question, uh, how to make the Colombian economy more competitive. And so there's, of course, we know that there's on the one hand the proper and, and the most efficient, the more efficient use of public resources and public funds. But also there's this, this other area of like deregulating uh, the, Colum the, the economic rules. environment. Clear exactly. To offer clear rules. Exactly. And so clear rules, consistent rules, predictable rules, uh, less obstacles to entrepreneurship, and definitely uh, more articulation, more horizontal articulation across uh, policy areas. Let me take two other questions and I'm afraid we don't have time for many more. The lady here, and I'm going to take another one afterwards. Good morning, my name is Would you take the microphone, please? Oh, I'm sorry. My name is Jimena Uribe, and I'm with International Cultural Events. I'm very proud to see your passion for the city of Barranquilla. It really shows what you have. Uh, my question is, I understand there's a lot of, like, for instance, construction companies moving to Barranquilla because of the big opportunities. What are you doing, one of the main things that you're doing in getting your citizens involved to be one of the first cities in the country of Colombia that is um, succeeding? Well, may, we're, may I take another sure, question? Sure. As, and let me just pick one more, all the way in the back. <laughs> you're going to have to fight for it. <laughs> Good morning, my name is Juan Misle, Latino Giant. Um, one of the main conditions that the OECD specifically assigns countries in order to ascend into the organization is to maintain high um, standards and labor practices and labor conditions. And given that, the, that Colombia right now uh, has an impunity of 93% for murders of trade unionists, and given according to the International Trade Union Confederation that the number of trade unionists murdered in Colombia uh, outnumber those in the rest of the world, what specific recommendations would you recommend for Colombia to tackle this endemic um, trend of murders of trade unionists? So two questions, one on investment, construction, and the other one on uh, the issue of uh, protecting the freedom of trade unions. Would you like to take the one from Barranquilla? No, what we are trying to offer is clear rules of the game. We are also investing in infrastructure, uh, uh, for competitiveness, um, better uh, urban roads. Um, uh, we are paving uh, the streets in the neighborhoods so uh, the poorest family has a, a, have a better uh, connectivity. We're also building highways to improve the access to the ports. 
and with the free trade agreements and with everything that's happening in, in, at the central government, uh, the private sector are seeing uh, good opportunities in Barranquilla. And what we try in the mayor's office is to facilitate them, their investment. I try every week to receive a private investors' interest in, in getting to Barranquilla or expanding their business they, they, they have right now. So it's like everything is in a, in a, in, you know, in a good, a, a, Ambiente, a good um, feeling, feeling for, for business. They feel comfortable. They feel a, there's also continuity in, in the public management uh, policies. Now we, we believe that for the, the next four years, we're going to have also a, a great a mayor. And I believe that gives us or strength our a, uh, our institutional capacity, and that makes it attractive for the uh, business uh, sector to look for Barranquilla. Thank you. Miguel, I'm going to give you 30 seconds because I'd like to invite Mr. Harrington up just on the issue of trade unions. It's been a very, very difficult issue for, for Colombia in the last uh, years. I think uh, there has been some improvement, I would say, in terms of protection of uh, union leaders. Uh, it was as a matter of fact, it was one of the conditions of the free trade agreement with the U.S. Um, and there's a lot of money that has been invested in protection um, and security and intelligence. I, I do think there's a cultural and mentality change that needs to accompany the peace process. Uh, many businessmen see union leaders as, their, um, as at the other side of an ideological spectrum more closely related with guerrillas uh, than with political debate. And I think that's, that's, that should be the past. Uh, I think uh, businessmen should see union leaders as their allies uh, in the construction of a completely different uh, private environment. But as the peace process, it, it would also take time. Thank you. Let me ask you to thank the panel with me. Why don't we stay here while Mr. and welcome Mr. Harrington up here as well. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for part. All right, I know we're behind schedule, so I'll try and get us out of here in less than three minutes. How about that? Um, I first, I want to recognize Peter and Jason, right? Um, and the great team here at the Adrian Arsh Center um, for putting on this fantastic event. I think um, you know, those of us in the trade community a lot of times focus on the federal level, but where things really happen is at the local and municipal level. And, um, and so to, to highlight that is, I think, of, of immense importance. I want to recognize you, Alcaldesa, um, and um, who I had to do a little bit of background to find out a little bit more about you. So I, I asked a really good friend of mine about you, and um, <clears throat> she said, among other, um, among, among other deep compliments, she said, you're deeply committed to good governance, ethics, and transparency. You're a willing partner in advancing public-private partnerships to guarantee continuity and inclusion and further economic development. And uh, basically, in short, she said, you're considered by many observers to be the best mayor in Colombia. So... Uh, <laughs> So that, that good friend of mine happens to be sitting right here in the front row. <laughs> Her name is Vicky Ibanez, um, of our incredible, our dynamic AmCham Colombia partners in, in, in Barranquilla. So um, our deep congratulations for your uh, immensely strong record and all that you're doing on the municipal level um, to further the remarkable turnaround story that is Colombia. Um, the Chamber and, and our member companies have obviously been active in Colombia for decades, including advocating tirelessly for the landmark FTA, our two countries share. Uh, but two weeks ago, we undertook a first-of-its-kind mission for us. Um, we had the opportunity to partner with the State Department on a joint delegation to Colombia with Senior Advisor to Secretary Kerry, Ambassador David Thorne. And beyond just bilateral trade, our mission assumed the priority of what Ambassador Thorne calls economic diplomacy. So thanks to Ambassador Pinzon and his terrific team, our delegation was able to meet with President Santos, uh, Vice President Vargas Lleras, uh, as well as um, many senior cabinet officials. And among the many other accomplishments, 
um, apart from trade, we were able to emphasize um, the array of corporate social responsi responsibility endeavors our companies are undertaking in Colombia and uh, our dedication to human capital and healthcare development initiatives, particularly to one of the last questions in rural areas and previously impacted conflict zones. So that's one thing that the private sector is doing, is to focus on, on those areas that you mentioned. Um, so you can imagine our surprise and delight to learn of last week's breakthrough in peace talks and the president's trip to Havana shortly after our return. I'm not gonna claim any knowledge previously of, the, of that, so, um, but there's, uh, there's obviously still a long road ahead, but the world's longest running conflict is, is, uh, is on its way to coming to an end. So that's an amazing story in itself, um, but who would have believed that a country that was plagued by violence just years ago is now a beacon of free enterprise, free markets in the Americas, on the cusp of OED accession, and uh, is even being talked about as the next logical participant from the Americas in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. Um, and here in this, this, um, this uh, institution of hallowed global foreign policy, I submit to you that Colombia is much more now than just a regional story, uh, especially as diplomats gather at UNGA. Um, I think, aside from being one of the world's most promising emerging markets, um, it gives hope to the hopeless in places like Syria, um, Ukraine, among numerous other troubles. Others that there's a way out of the morass and better days ahead. And it's been a combined effort of society and government at all levels, from dedicated people like Ambassador Pinzon in his previous role as defense minister, to you, Alcaldesa, at the municipal level as mentioned, um, to Colombian society in general. Um, so we salute all of you. And speaking for the chamber, we look forward to following the results of October 25th very closely and to continuing to be your steadfast partner on this incredible journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Neil. Thank you to all of you, and thank you to my team that's in the back.